Good evening and welcome to the Royal Institution. Tonight we are going to enter a world where some of the oldest visions that have stirred man's imagination blend into the latest achievements of his science. Tonight we are going to enter the world of robots. Robots like Shaky, developed by the Stanford Research Institute. Shaky is controlled by a large computer. He's directed through a radio antenna. Through a television camera, he gets visual feedback from his environment. The box appears on the monitor screen. The computer analyzes the traces which appear on the visual display until it can interpret them as an object it recognizes. Shaky gets tactile feedback through his feelers. He's able to move boxes with his push bar. He's programmed to solve certain problems that can be contrived in his environment. To choose, say, an alternative route to a certain point when his way has been blocked. Shaky is unquestionably an ingenious product of computer science and engineering. But is he anything more? Is he the forerunner of startling developments which will endow machines with artificial intelligence, enable them to compete with and even outstrip the human brain? Robots like this one in Stanford University's computer science department are able to perform certain tasks. But will robots ever be able to perform a wide variety of tasks? To learn from their experience? To use what they've learned to solve these new problems beyond those envisaged by their human programmers? Or will their so-called intelligence, their performance, remain forever at the level of a three-year-old child at its first game? One man who's pessimistic about the long-term prospects of artificial intelligence is our speaker tonight, Sir James Lighthill, one of Britain's most distinguished scientists. He's the Lucasian Professor of Applied Mathematics at Cambridge and has worked in many fields of applied mathematics. He's a former director of the Royal Aircraft Establishment at Farnborough. Last year, he compiled a report for the Science Research Council which condemned work on general purpose robots. Not surprisingly, scientists who've been working on such robots have reacted strongly in defense of their field. Three of them are here tonight to challenge Sir James' findings. After they've had their say, the discussions will be open to bring in members of the audience here. With many mathematicians and engineers, computer scientists and psychologists among them, their contribution will be particularly welcome. Before Sir James Lighthill makes his opening, opening speech, I should like to introduce the men who will lead the debate against him. Donald Mickey is Professor of Machine Intelligence in the University of Edinburgh. His laboratory is the only one in this country engaged on large-scale robot research. John McCarthy is Professor of Computer Science at Stanford University in the United States, another great center of robot research. He's the director of Stanford's Artificial Intelligence Laboratory and has flown over especially for this program. And Richard Gregory is a professor in the Department of Anatomy at Bristol University. His concern with artificial intelligence arises out of his work on perception. Before going to Bristol, he was a founder member of the Edinburgh team and helped launch its robot project. And now the moment has come to meet our principal speaker, Professor Sir James Lighthill. I'll begin by making a few distinctions between automation, which is replacing human beings by machines for specific purposes, that has made great progress in the 20th century and where the replacements have been put into effect humanely has led to general benefit, improved productivity, creating higher standards of living. And a general purpose robot, an idea that has often been described involving an automatic device that could substitute for a human being over a wide range of human activities. That's what I shall argue is a mirage. Automation is the province of the control engineer. He designs feedback control systems 
that act to reduce any change in some quantity from its desired value. For example, in this automatic aircraft landing, the throttles move so as to reduce changes in speed of the aircraft and other controls reduce deviations from the desired glide path. Increasingly, an important role in automation is played by computers. A computer is an extremely fast, reliable, and biddable device for manipulating numbers and similar symbols according to rules clearly prescribed in a program. Computers are tools of the greatest value in a very wide range of human activities, including all branches of scientific research, and we'll see examples of that, and all branches of engineering. The control engineers have made excellent use of computers in automation, for example, in numerically controlled machine tools uh, that will cut metal parts to geometrical shapes defined by equations in a program. One of the important new branches of science is computer science. Workers in computer science constantly improve our repertoire of things that can be done with computers, not just arithmetic and geometry, also algebra and calculus and logic. Logic by computer means manipulating symbols, symbols representing different statements uh, in accordance with a program to find out what can be deduced from what and so on. Advanced automation can mean automation making use of the computer's full logical potentialities developed by computer scientists. Uh, for example, in a modern uh, computer-aided design for an electrical printed circuit, the computer's role in identifying all these current paths is still very specialized, replacing human beings for a very specific purpose, but most effective. Other automatic devices exploiting the logical capabilities of computers are used to organize scientific data through data banking and retrieval. For example, in a data bank of different properties, boiling point, latent heat, etc., of hundreds of thousands of chemical compounds. I've been talking about computers and their benefits to us in a lot of fields, but I must come to the other side of the case. Computers have been oversold. Understandably enough, as they are very big business indeed. It's common knowledge that some firms bought computers in the expectation of benefits which failed to materialize. My concern tonight, however, is with the overselling of the longer term future of computers. The scientific community has a heavy responsibility to put forward its carefully considered view of the facts to avoid the public being seriously misled. Just as the U.S. National Academy of Sciences did in 1966 when it reported that enormous sums of money had been spent on the aim of language translation by computer with very little useful result, a conclusion not subsequently shaken. Failures continually occurred also in computer recognition of human speech or handwritten letters and in automatic proving of theorems in higher mathematics. But our subject tonight is robots, and we must identify what they are. Several groups of able computer scientists have for many years been adopting a particular point of view regarding their work and given it a name, artificial intelligence or machine intelligence. The idea is to operate from a sort of bridge uh, between studies of how brains of living creatures work and studies of how computer programs and automatic devices based on them work. This interesting point of view has been current for over 20 years. Please notice that this view does not just mean that people who study brains, psychologists and neurobiologists should use computers. Those, as I mentioned earlier, are used effectively in all branches of science now. Nor does it mean another obvious fact that in writing programs for computers we are influenced by introspectively considering how a human brain would carry out the logical processes required. The idea of artificial intelligence means that besides doing these two things, we in engage in a definite bridge uh, activity between advanced automation uh, and computer science on the one hand and studies of brains of central nervous systems using computers on the other. The bridge activity proposed is building robots. I use robot not to mean an automatic device aimed at replacing human beings for a specific purpose in an economical way. A robot, rather, 
is um, an automatic device uh, designed to mimic a certain range of human functions without seeking in any useful sphere of human activities to replace human beings. This robot, which you've already seen from the Stanford Research Institute, is one of the most sophisticated in current operation. I'll ask, why should robots be built and studied? There are at least two serious answers to this question. First, that generalized information on automatic devices may result, which can be of use in a wide range of specialized automation problems. Second, that a device which mimics a human function, such as how we avoid an obstacle, may assist in making a scientific study of that function. I shall argue that these were eminently good and sufficient reasons for embarking on the work 20 or 10 years ago. In practice, however, the line of approach has led to somewhat disappointing results in these respects. We have acquired rather little generalized information applicable to a wide range of automation problems. Instead, we find that specialized problems are best treated by specialized methods, and I shall try to explain why that is. Similarly, the sciences of psychology and neurobiology have benefited not from robo work in general, but from those computer models that take into account really extensive bodies of experimental data on psychological behavior or on nerve cell networks in the brain. Before I expand on these reasons for a certain disenchantment with robot research, I shall predict that people nevertheless will go on building them. At all periods of history, the human imagination has been captivated by the idea that the mysterious arts, whether of the sorcerer's cell in earlier times or the scientist's laboratory today, might be used for a, per a process of, as it were, artificially giving birth. Whether for this reason or not, a large section of the public finds the very idea of robots thrilling. It wants robots. It's prepared to pay for robots if only as entertainment. One of, well, money was being made at the end of the 18th century, not only from mechanical dolls of great ingenuity, but also from exhibiting large, apparently automatic, chess-playing robots. Their capabilities actually arose, like those of the Daleks today, from the presence of a man skillfully concealed inside. <laughs> Science fiction in all the media has helped to intensify this old fascination with robots as artificial beings artificially given birth. Modern robots certainly seem to imitate children in some respects. They play games, they do puzzles, they build towers of bricks, they recognize pictures in drawing books. Scientists may well find building them attractive either because the very idea exercises its old fascination on them or because the public as represented in funding bodies, still feels that fascination enough to be prepared to pay. On this, I'll say no more. The last thing I want to do is to argue against the entertainment industry. 